Hello everyone and good evening or good day depending where you are. Hope you guys are all well and welcome to the second semester and the first lesson of the second semester. I hope you guys are all well. <clears throat> how are you going mate? Anthony, you alright? I'm wonderful, how are you there? Good, good. I'm glad one of us is doing good. <laughs> now then, what we're going to do today um, is that I think there were a few questions that were not answered from last week. We're going to do that and then we're going to carry on with our first lesson for the second semester. Now, because we're now entering the second semester, we're going to go slightly deeper uh, into the topics. And so we need to focus a little bit more. Last week, we had a really nice, light and a fun lesson. So we're, going to, we're, going to, we're still going to make it fun, but we just need to dig a little deeper. So I need a bit of help from you guys. Whatever you need to ask, right, it must be related to the topics from now on, okay? So we really need to focus and ask from what we're learning so we can build on that foundation we had in the second semester, okay? It's very important. As usual, if you have any questions, you can ask them through the... Um, through the website chat room. Also, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to send them through Zoom. All right, so if that's more practical for you, you can do that too. And um, what are those few questions that were unanswered from last week then? Okay, so uh, we had a question that was from Steve. It says, what happens to individuality when we are all one in Adam? When we are all one in Adam, what happens to individuality? When we're all in, well, that's actually wonderful because we, we all maintain our individuality, which is actually a really interesting thing about spirituality. Because our faces are different, the way we think, the way we act, the way we feel, the way we perceive, everything is actually different. And we're all very, very um, unique individuals, actually. And that's really a good thing. And in spirituality, nothing of that gets lost. In fact, everybody's individuality becomes. Um, exactly their unique way of expressing themselves and um, and um, showing their uh, expression of bestowal. So we will all be keeping our individuality. It's very important that everybody maintains their individuality. And in fact, um, for for us, for Kabbalists, it's very, very important not to delete um, or put aside or try to get rid of any attribute that exists in the world because everything that exists in the world actually has a place where it really gives the, gives the world, gives reality, that functionality, that speciality. Um, so we'll all be keeping our individuality. And everybody is very, very special. You should all know that. Now, uh, Jose is asking, what is a mitzvah? What is, the, what is the first that I can do for my friend? What is the first, what is well, that? I, I think he meant the first thing, but he says, what is the first that I can, I think it's the first thing I can do for my friend. The first thing you can do for your friend, which we're going to, you know, we're going to be studying this um, throughout next semester as well. But the, the, you know, the best thing to do to a friend is to give them a good mood, all right? We all like to make people happy. So if you ever think about what I can do for my friend, try to give them a good mood, all right? Okay, and yeah. uh, his question, part of that was, what is a mitzvah? A mitzvah, a mitzvah, this is how it's spelled. Let's do this right. Okay, this is a mitzvah. A mitzvah is a precept. It's actually a, or a good deed, let's call it, right? Now, this is a bit in religious terms, right? So, you, you know, when you do a good deed in religion, they call it a mitzvah. Okay, that's a Z, by the way. Um, however, 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 because many things are different in Kabbalah with respect to, you know, traditional beliefs out there, a mitzvah is actually correcting an egoistic attribute and bring it to bestowal. If I can do that with one of my attributes, that means I did a precept or a good deed or a mitzvah. Okay, that's a mitzvah. So it has nothing to do with any um, religious actions at all, because some people confuse it with religious actions. They think, according to their culture and religion, that mitzvah or a good deed is a religious deed, like, you know, you go and do religious actions. However, in spirituality, it has a different meaning. Um, because we're talking about inner change in spirituality, every time I make that inner change and bring one of my egoistic attributes into a um, bestowing into a spiritual attributes into a f 
into equivalence of form with the Creator, that's called a mitzvah. Yes. Um, there was also from Enoch, if the Big Bang was created, I'm sorry, if the universe was created by the Big Bang some 14 billion years ago, and Adam is the first man to discover the Creator, where did the story of creation in the Bible come from? Well, that's good. We're going to be touching on that, actually, in these lessons. We're going to talk about how the worlds were created. Uh, and the, basically, 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang is the first initiation of um, the whole of creation. When we talk about Adam, we're thinking about just one man or an individual, but don't think of him like an individual, because as an individual, actually, he's not very unique, because when everything comes together into perfection, then it becomes Adam, and then he's unique. So when they're talking about the whole of creation, they're talking about the states where the worlds were created, and where the man was created and how he was created. But in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, they actually don't talk about what happened before. Who talks about what happened before? Well, a great Kabbalist by the name of Ari from the 16th century. He talks about what happened before. Now, why doesn't Moses talk about it? Well, what, what's the purpose of any Kabbalist, right? We have to think about, we have to always think towards the goal. If I want to raise somebody and make something out of them, and I want to teach them how to, how to get somewhere, how to become that something, I want to teach them exactly the things they need to know. Because if I give them more than what they need to know, it becomes redundant. So Moses, when he started writing, and he started with Bereshit, okay, the whole of creation. Um, that's the first part, as you know, after Torah, it's the longest part as well. So when he talked about that, he was basically talking about how, first of all, man's contact with the Creator started and what it was all for. So the whole world was created and then um, as the worlds were created, man was created. All of those is just talking about the desire to receive as being created and that desire to receive coming to a state where he actually recognizes the Creator that has created him. And that's where he's starting. And Ari talked about the phases before that. And <clears throat> Why? Because Ari started writing during the time of the Renaissance in Italy. It was a time of science and humanity had begun a new state of development. So the Kabbalists thought, oh, why should we wait till the 20th century until the scientists think about Big Bang and they discover it? Why don't we just tell it to them in the 16th century? And that's what Ari did. He just wrote about it in the 16th century and said there was a Big Bang and everything started created. Crea uh, the whole of creation started then. So a lot of capitalists actually did a lot of, a lot of revelation before. Also in perception of reality, the writers of the Zohar 2000 years ago were talking about how reality was perceived only inside a person. And only recently quantum physics and, and physicists are beginning to realize that we're just sensing everything inside of us. Right? But as you can see in our five senses, we're still living in the physics of Newton unfortunately, but as our perception will develop, we'll see that we'll begin to live everything inside of us and we'll see the outside world as a leverage to make that inner change and then our outer world will change as well. Radio. Okay, um, Stephen S. Is practicing love and bestow in this world with people without the point in the heart possible or advisable? Um, with, okay, we don't do spiritual work with people outside of the group. And the reason is because we're not in the same, same, we're not on the same page. Okay, if I start going out now and start, you know, um, practicing what we learn in the group on the outside, they might look at me as a weirdo and they'd be right. Okay, they'd be right to think that too. 
Um, so love and bestow, practicing it on the outside, I'd do it according to the people you know, according to the environment you're in. Obviously, we're not bad people, right? We don't go out and do harm to people. We treat people nicely on the outside. We're rather polite. We are good citizens, as they say. Okay, however, to go a step further and to start really practicing that in society may make you look a little weird. So we don't recommend it. It's not advisable. And it's really good to do things um, with people who see um, eye to eye. You know, we understand why we're doing things because we're studying and by doing those practical things we want to come to an inner change. So unless, you know, we're in the same direction, um, we're not really going to understand each other and the other person might feel you know, a little um, shaky. <laughs> okay, so then, you know, then <laughs> don't go too hard on the love on the outside, you know what I mean? Now, Louise is asking, um, this is, let's see, will we learn how to activate the third eye with Kabbalah or do, do we do this individually? Will we touch on raising the oil? And also, will we learn via the course to tune into our sixth sense? Okay, the third eye. I don't know, because we don't have a third eye, as you can see, I only got two, but we do have a dot in the heart, which is rather special, okay, and from that we will develop a soul. Uh, you can call this the sixth sense, okay, there we go, we can call that the sixth sense, or we can call it the soul, I like to call it the soul, because I used to like the song Soul Man, um, so I like to call it the soul, but um, we don't have a third eye, actually, so, <laughs> but, but we will have a soul. How's that? Okay, and our last question from the past semester yeah. comes from our friend Enoch, and that's a very, very nice question. Yeah. It's uh, one of the reasons why I saved this one for last. It says, who is Rabbi Yehuda Leib Halevi Ashlag, and who is... Rav Baruch Shalom Halevi Ashlag the Rabash. Oh, sorry. Yeah. First was the Balasulam. Balasulam, okay. And the second one was Baruch uh, Shalom Halevi Ashlag the Rabash. Okay. And what is the meaning of the words Rabbi and Rav? Rav. Rav means somebody greater than me. Uh, and Rabbi means it's like my greater than me, kind of. Um, how the, I don't know how to make that into a proper translation. Rabbi is like, like I, it's like somebody who's greater than me and that person I'm learning from is like my teacher kind of thing. And Rav means somebody greater than me, like, like a teacher or like a professor in school. Um, now, Bala Sulam, he is the main, um, uh, he's the main Kabbalist that sources we're studying from. So Bala Sulam, he was the greatest Kabbalist um, of the 20th century, and he's the person who actually made a commentary on the book of Zohar. That's why they call him Baal HaSulam. Baal HaSulam means the master or the owner of the ladder, uh, and the ladder to spirituality, obviously. And he made a commentary on the, on the Zohar, which is known as the um, ladder commentary, the Sulam commentary. Um, so he's, actually, he's the actual Kabbalist who made the Zohar available for us to study from, because originally that wasn't even in Hebrew, it was in Aramaic, so Baal Islam really rearranged everything so we could kind of dig our um, you know, fingers into that book. He is also the writer of the Talmud Eser Sefrot, which is a commentary on the book of Ari, which I just spelt out. Um, and he, Ari wrote the book Tree of Life in the 16th century. So Baal Islam got all his materials and arranged all of it in such a way that we could actually study it like a textbook. Uh, and like all Kabbalists, what he did was was very, very um, helpful to all of us because we're in the 20th century. He realized that we're in an academic um, century and people need to learn in an academic way because that's what our nature is right now. And that's how the situation of the, the state of the world is right now. So he arranged all that for us, um, all the texts and also all his articles. And it's a good thing you mentioned it because I have two of his books, which I will recommend in a minute. Um, for us to for us to get because we will be studying them on and off. That's it. And Rabash Rabash is obviously the uh, the last Kabbalist. 
he is actually the student of Baal and he is the teacher of our teacher, Dr. Michael Lightman. And he is the writer of three volumes of articles. He is the only Kabbalist in human history to have written articles on how to do this work practically inside a society. So Rabash is an amazing, amazing Kabbalist. Um, and he did us a huge favor simply because if he hadn't written those articles for us about how to, about the impressions that we w we should be getting on the path, we just not have any compass to do any work. So he is an amazing Kabbalist, uh, and we use him extensively, obviously. So Balaslam and Rabash are the main sources that we're using, and those sources are indexed. Um, they're based on Zohar and the Tree of Life by the Ari. I hope that's it. We've got about 40 minutes left to cover three hours. Of the rest this. of these questions just came in now, so we'll do them at the well, end of we'll, class. Yeah, exactly. We'll do them later on. Okay, now, please, you must do me a favor because we've got a limited amount of time with a lot of stuff to cover. First of all, the books. Now, we've got some books. The Sage's Fruit. Okay, I know you can't see it, but just bear with me, Sage's Fruit, which are the articles of Baal Sulam, the essays of Baal Sulam, and we've got another book, Sage's Fruit, which are the letters of Baal Sulam. And I'm just running over these quickly. It's good to have. This is a book, and <laughs> it's, a, it's Shamati. I know you probably can't see it on the screen. It's white on white. Only from here I can see it. So um, if you can't see it, it's not a problem. But the book is called Shamati. And this is a very important book. All right, this is Shamati. All right, so um, Shmuel, thank you. This is it's called Shamati. It means I heard. Okay, I heard. It's a very good book. We need to get this. This one is in English. You can get all our books on www.kabbalahbooks.info. And I think they do international shipping. Okay, if you don't feel like getting the book, there are also all articles on the website. Okay, so not to worry. If you don't like, um, if you don't want to get the books, they're all on the website as well. It's just that I like to read from a book, you know, still old fashioned. There you go. Um, and here we've got Rabash's social writings. This is very, very important. This is all the practical stuff that we're going to be studying. This actually is going to teach us how to how to do everything practically inside a group. So Rabash social writings, also very handy to get. The green big encyclopedia we've got, you already know, Kabbalah for the student, this, this thick one here. So we don't really need to say anything about that. Um, and there we go. So these are the books that we're going to go through. Now this second semester is, like I said, we're going to dig a little deeper. And the whole important idea of the second semester is we need to understand that Kabbalah is a process. It's a process that takes time, just like a person grows up in this world, just like a baby is born and takes little baby steps, starts crawling first, starts to get up, you know, with our help, and then starts to take these little steps and then falls, gets up, falls, gets up. And, you know, it, it takes a while until the kid starts to walk run around, still falls, and then until it becomes something customary, and they can walk and run. And as we grow up, uh, what happens? We begin to understand the world around us. We begin to understand what life is all about. And all that, if you look at our lives, takes a bit of time, right? Um, and so Kawala is also a process, because if I want to develop spiritually, it's obviously not going to happen by just taking a pill and that's it. I'm not going to fill it with just a little pill. So what I need to do is to make sure that I understand that we're going to go through a process together. And this process, um, how well we go through it, depends on everybody's effort on an individual basis and everybody's effort on a collective basis, just like inside a family, right? In a family, if we all contribute, the family you know, has a better time uh, if only some people are pulling all the weight, then it's obviously going to be harder times for all of us. So in the group as well, the society, we're going to learn how to bring everything together so that we can make this process of developing spiritually, um, according to the wisdom of Kabbalah, in a, 
um, in a nice flow, which is nice and fast. Obviously, it's not going to be too long. It's not going to be like a you know, um, too too long of a path, but it will take some time until spirituality builds up inside of us. Just like with anything, you know, just like with anything. If we go to, if we go and want to become a doctor, it's going to take five years at uni, probably another two or three if I want to specialize in something, and then if I want a PhD, you know, add another two three on that, and then. You know, by the time you're a doctor with a you know PhD on your on your label, it takes about 15, 20 years. Now Kabbalah, fortunately, is not going to take that long. But we do need to make sure that we understand there's a process. Now, just as before, let's see what we need to do. As all of us come to the group, we need to know that we need to integrate ourselves into a group. We all know that before, where we have a teacher, a Rav, we have books, and we have the group. And this group is aimed towards the Creator, which is bestowal and love. And this dot in the heart is what's going into the group, okay? Our, our corporeality remains in corporeality. This is our corporeal life. And that's where it stays. So we take into spirituality something very special from inside of us. And the reason we need to do that, the reason we need to understand that we need to separate these two things, is there's something specific we want to develop. We're working on this. It's like when you want to become a musician, right? You, you focus on, let's say, an instrument, and you're not really focused on anything else. You focus just on that instrument and your skills and techniques just for playing that instrument because you can't do 10 things at the same time. So you put corporeal onto the side and in there we take just a dot in the heart because our corporeality at the moment is also our egoistic nature. And what we don't want to do when we integrate ourselves into the group is to take egoism with us because it's already developed. What we want to do is take in our inclination, inclination to bestow. All right, that's what we're taking in. And that inclination to bestow, that dot in the heart, is what's going to turn into a soul inside this environment here. Just like a baby is born and turns into a grown, mature person inside the environment of the corporeal world. All right? It's the same kind of mentality, which we talked about before. But through this situation, the question remains, how am I supposed to connect with the Creator? How am I going to build that relationship? Well, this is what we're going to look at today. How can I use the environment in order to connect to the Creator? In order for me to do that, I need to first take a few advices, a few recommendations from the Kabbalists. So let's do that. We're going to read from Shamati. And we're going to read from Shamati number one. And if you've got this book, it's the first article. And this article actually summarizes the whole of spirituality. Oh, there you go. That's our Shamati book on the, sc on the screen for you. Shamati number one. It's called, There is none else besides Him. There's none else besides Him means that there is only the Creator in the world. And that He is behind everything and behind everyone. So let's read a little bit and then let's talk about what the article is talking about. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start to slowly, slowly relate things that happen to us all right, with respect to the recommendations of the article. And we're going to do it step by step, though, so we don't get confused along the way. Because if we run before we can crawl, we're obviously going to, um, we're not going to get far, are we? Right, Sam, so let's start and read. It's on page 15, and we're going to read until, we're going to read quite a bit. Well, well, let's see how we go. There is none else besides Him. It is written, there is none else besides Him. This means that there is no other force in the world that has the ability to do anything against Him. 
And what man sees that there are things in the world that deny the higher household. The reason is that this is his will. So in this first paragraph, Baal HaSalam is saying everything in the world, whatever happens, everything I think, everything I want, everything that any politician, any family member, any person on the street, any animal, plant, the galaxy does, is all under the control of one thing, the Creator. However, we see, according to our eyes, something different. We think Tom, Dick and Harry have something to do with my life or have an influence in my life. We think that a president or, I don't know, um, some king or some other person has any impact on my destiny or on my life. But Kabbalists are saying, that's all wrong. How could that possibly be? How could a divine providence leave my destiny in the hands of another person? That's just not right. It's not logical either. Could you imagine leaving your children into the hands of a psychopath? You wouldn't, right? So the Creator wouldn't either, because if you look at the world, they're full of them, right? So the Creator obviously has to keep the leash on, right? Because everybody's a little button trigger happy lately. Trigger button happy, is it? <laughs> is that what they call? Okay, trigger happy. So button happy, everybody's, you know, winding themselves up. So the, the Kabbalists are saying only the Creator can control everything, but we don't see it that way. That's what the first paragraph is saying. And the, the reason we don't see it that way is because exactly how the Creator designed everything, just so that it doesn't feel like there is a Creator and it doesn't feel like that there is a Creator doing everything. And it is deemed a correction called the left rejects and the right adducts, meaning that which the left rejects is considered This means that there are things in the world which to begin with aim to divert a person from the right way and by which he is rejected from sanctity. So the reason we don't see the Creator is because it gives us the possibility to get off the right track. Okay, that sounds a little funny. I mean, who would want to put us off from the right track? Well, the thing is, if we don't have these deviations, we don't learn. Right? So in life, this is why we need two opposites of everything. Good, bad, beautiful, ugly, night, day. So the Creator has set up a reality in such a way that on purpose there are things in the world that puts us off the track. We go sidetracking. And the benefit from the rejections, the benefits of getting out of the path, is that through them a person receives a need and a complete desire for the Creator to help him, since he sees that otherwise he is lost. Not only does he not progress in this work, but he sees that the progress that that is, he lacks the strength to observe Torah and mitzvot, even in lolishma. Okay, now we're getting technical terms, not to worry. Okay, very simple stuff. He's explaining, again, something very briefly. The reason he's talking like this is because he wrote this like 100 years ago. Okay, so it's like Shakespeare 300 years ago. So you have to kind of like put it back into 21st century mode. So he's saying, listen, the reason the Creator wants, to, wants us to get off the path and have us confused, make mistakes, is because by going through um, traumas or turmoils, we can actually build a desire to get closer to the Creator. Now remember, we are all a desire to receive, right? So if we're a desire to receive, all I have to do from this dot in the heart is to make inside the society a big desire to want to get closer to the Creator. Right? It's just one plus one equals two. And if I get sidetracked, if I'm going through turmoils, traumas, misunderstandings in life, going through, you know, like bad experiences, this is actually not a bad thing because it kind of attracts us. It, it makes us want to discover the Creator more because we want an answer to our problems, don't we? We don't want to just, you know, stay in that swamp. We want to get out and find a solution. And it says that sometimes this is hard and sometimes people, you know, 
um, feel really heavy about it. But I've got good news, okay, because we know we've got the secret on how to overcome all these things that a person feels along the way. That only by genuinely overcoming all the obstacles above reason can he observe the Torah and the mitzvot. Torah and mitzvot means straightforward spirituality and correction. Okay, that's what Torah is from the word light and user manual. So if I use the books correctly, okay, because they're a user manual for me, I should get light, which is wisdom. Okay, so that's what Torah is. Mitzvot, like I answered one of our friends a while ago, mitzvot is I can use the books in order to get wise so I can change myself, I can go through in a change. That's what he's talking about, really. Let me read that again. That only by genuinely overcoming all the obstacles above reason can he observe the Torah and mitzvot. But he does not always have the strength to overcome above reason. So we have a few questions here, right? We want to figure out, okay, what's he talking about? What is above reason? We need to discover this. It's an important topic. So if you've got a pen and paper, you should make notes, right? As we read, we should know what he's talking about. So above reason, what's that? How am I supposed to go above my reason? Otherwise, he's forced to deviate, God forbid, from the way of the Creator, even from Lolishma. So, what is Lolishma? What's going on here? Well, that was one of our questions that just came in from Claire. What's Lolishma? Okay, good. All right, so we'll all get to that afterwards. And he who always feels that the shattered is greater than the whole, meaning that there are many more descents from a sense, and he does not see an end to these states, and he will forever remain outside of holiness, for he sees that it is difficult for him to observe even a little as a jot, unless by overcoming above reason. But he's not always able to overcome, and what shall be the end? Then he comes to the decision that no one can help him, but the Creator Himself. This causes him to make a heartfelt demand that the Creator will open his eyes and heart and truly bring him nearer to eternal adhesion with God. It thus, follow, it thus follows that all the rejections he had, be, he had experienced had come from the Creator. All right, now this is a long article. We're just going to stop ourselves there. But the gist of the article is, is, the gist of the article is very simple. Let's just make a few bullet point notes so we get our head around it. We want to build a connection with the Creator. So our approach to life now has to start taking this shape, right? Me through the environment, which is the study. Okay, consider the environment as the study, the learning, right? Through the learning, I should begin to somehow direct my approach to perceiving reality according to the recommendations of the Creator in order to feel, um, according to the recommendation of the Kabbalists, in order to feel the Creator. All right. So the essence of the article is simple. That everything that happens to me in life, this is me with the dot in the heart, right? Everything that happens to me in life, family, work, health, traffic jam, my thoughts, my desires, even my, even my bodily movements, even all the words I'm saying right now, even the grin on my face, the hand movements, everything. Oh my goodness, it's weird. But it's, they're saying the Creator controls everything. And we don't see it that way though. And that's called a concealment. So the Creator is behind a concealment. And we have to overcome that concealment. And overcoming it is actually building that soul. Um, and how we can do that is here in the environment together. As we study together, we will 
develop our internality. Until then though, we just should digest for the moment that everything that happens to me in my life is coming to me from the Creator only for one purpose and one purpose only, to get me here. Because from the first semester you know that p creation has a purpose and we need to get to that purpose. Now, precisely by the study, we can use all our knowledge, all the, um, all, all the uh, facets and the aspects of the environment to get to the Creator. We can focus ourselves, direct ourselves, begin to relate to reality according to the Kabbalists who have attained those states so that we can come closer, faster to the goal with less suffering. Right? That's called conscious development. So first things first, I need to understand that even though I don't feel the world like this, everything comes to me from the Creator. My thoughts, my desires, everything I do, hand movements, the, what the neighbor does, what the world does, what the presidents are doing, what everybody in the whole of creation, including the planets and the stars and the, and the butterflies, everything, every little detail is inside a system and everything is running like clockwork. And we are inside a system that's operating on us from without and from within. Okay, and that's also why in most religions there is faith in destiny because they believe, rightfully so, the Kabbalists actually established religions in the past, but destiny is, is the whole layout of creation from beginning to end to bring it to that final end. And what else does the article tell us? Well, it says, on the way, we're going to go through some ups and downs. Um, why does that happen? Well, simply because it happens in life as well, doesn't it? I mean, in life, if I want to attain something, it usually has obstacles, doesn't it? If I want to become, I don't know, if I want to become, let's say, a lawyer, I have to work hard, I have to get into exams, I have to do this and I have to do that, and it's a lot of work. But at the end of the day, I can, I can kind of imagine the light at the end of the tunnel, aim myself towards what I imagine the future is going to be like, and I can really come to terms with all the problems that I'm going to have, you know, being a lawyer or a doctor or whatever I want to be, or a musician or an artist, right? Whatever I want to be in life. If you want to be good at something, anything, it doesn't matter what, you're going to have to go through these moments where it's going to become a bit of a trial for you. It's going to become a bit tiring. It's going to become a bit confusing, blurry. It's going to be, there's going to be states of, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. Have you ever had those moments, you know, like I've feeling, had several. yeah, feeling heavy, not wanting to do, desireless, depressed, feeling like you're not going to succeed. All those things happen in life. <clears throat> The precise reason they happen in life is to prepare us also for spirituality. And only those who go through such turmoils but want to carry on discovering the Creator, want to carry on getting to that goal, come to the goal, just like any successful musician, artist, um, or any, any business person. Imagine all those business people, right? We look at them from the sides and we think, oh, he's had it lucky. Okay, but it's not like that because by the time he becomes a successful person, he has to go through a lot of hell. And we're not going to go through hell, okay, just to delete what I said. We're going to go through a nice state of development. But what I'm just saying is that study the work together in the article, it says, can be a bit of a turmoil, but there's a good reason for that, is because it increases our desire to unite with the Creator. This desire inside the group. And this is actually what we need. Why? Because we're desires. We are a desire to receive. How can I grow my desire to receive for something? By 
giving effort, right? If I make an effort to attain something, despite the dramas, despite the dramas, then I will have a great desire to be what I want to be. That great desire to be like the Creator is the turning point, is the flipping point, is that, is, is when you just change. But without having a desire, without, like in the book, it says a person needs to come to a heartfelt demand that this is really what I want. If a person doesn't come to that, just like in life nothing happens, spirituality doesn't happen either because we're a desire to receive. So everything that we go through on the path is all good. We can't say that there is anything bad, even though in the article it says a person goes through this and that. But if the Creator is doing everything to get me to the goal, how can possibly anything negative be? There can only be states where I can use as a leverage to advance so that I can build this vessel and make it a huge desire for the Creator. Does that make sense? Yes, <laughs> that came from the way here. Yeah, does it make sense? Please nod. Just nod to make me feel good. Okay. Give us some yeah. thumbs up, some thumbs down, okay. some nods. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> but look, the reason I'm explaining it to you like this is because it's like our normal lives. Right? Spirituality, sometimes people think it's somewhere out there, airy fairy, out, out in the clouds. Okay? Sometimes people think we're just going to get a pair of wings and start flying. All right? But this is not Peter Pan. The whole reason that this world is created is because this world is a reflection of how things are supposed to develop at the spiritual level as well. So the Creator, even though in the article it says He is completely concealed, although He does everything, we have absolutely no idea He's doing it and we wouldn't even believe that He's doing it, right? Despite all that, our world is a stepping stone because by seeing what's happening in this world, we're actually revealing the Creator, aren't we? If we just learn how to approach reality correctly. So, the crea so it turns out, it turns out that by studying Kabbalah, we can begin to decipher everything that happens in the world. And then we can use everything that happens as a as like a sign, like traffic signs, to to maneuver and to get to the goal. Isn't that great? Right? <laughs> yes, it is great. Right, <laughs> right, okay. And this is why, although he's talking about problems and so on, a person feels heavy, doesn't want to do it, wants to run away, even though that is the situation. And most people, if you think about it, right, most people sometimes start a profession and they don't want to do it and they choose something else. They want to go and do something else, just like life as well. But Kabbalah is saying, listen, stick it out. Why? Because everything that's coming to you is a leverage. So they can never, ever, remember, you've got to write this on your wall, okay? You've got to really write it on your wall. There can never, ever, come bad from the Creator to anyone. Never. Ever. Not possible. Everything that comes is only a little nudge or a push that wants to get us forward a little bit. He wants to grow us like we grow children. Anybody has kids? You guys have kids? Put your hands up if you've got kids. I've got kids. Yes? Anybody? No? Okay, some people have great, lovely, great. Okay, so, and for those who don't, have some kids. They really help grow in spirituality. Wait, I'll give you some of mine if you don't. <laughs> hey, there you go. 
Oh, smart Alec. I got a three-year-old at home. Yeah. Uh, I'll give him away. There we go. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason is this, because we can learn from children, okay? And just like they run around, even though they fall, they don't stop trying to walk, do they? They fall, but they have this inner excitement to get up and start walking and running again. They fall, their knee bleeds, I don't know, they bang their heads here and there, but they don't stop running around. Because if they did, they'd never walk. So we need to learn from the kids. So in our world as well, as life moves on, no matter how things happen, we just have to keep walking. And the same in spirituality. So you have a good day, you have a bad day. But the whole idea is this behind this approach. You must understand that whatever I get in life, if I'm studying Kabbalah, whatever I get in life is only the Creator giving me a hand and showing me direction to move forward. Now, initially, we're going to have a very difficult time trying to decipher what he's trying to tell us with everything that happens in life because so do babies, right? We talk to babies when they're grown up and the kids just look at us and think, oh my God, what is she talking about? Why? Because they don't understand the language yet. So we don't understand the Creator's language either. So what do we have to do? We have to learn the language. And these books are going to teach us how. And that's the beauty about Kabbalah. You begin to learn this language of life, which the Creator is talking to us. And that is the beauty. Now, the important trick is how to use the environment correctly. We only, what else do I have here that I need to tell you? Now, I have told you this before, but we need to understand the Creator equals good and does good no matter what happens. I have to keep this in mind because he's trying to get me to the goal. And, and what? And how am I going to build the Creator in me is the next question. Okay. How can I build good that does good in me if I'm an egoist? Now, in our egoistic state, the only thing that's going to help me is a dot in the heart. And there's this huge separation between us and the Creator. So we don't feel the Creator at all, despite the fact that He's doing everything. In order to get to the Creator, there's a law in nature called equivalence of form. Same with our five senses. If the sound waves are not in the frequency wavelength of what my ears can take, I won't hear it. Same with the light waves, I won't be able to see it and so on. So in order to feel the Creator, I need this dot in the heart to come to the same frequency that the Creator is acting on. Oops. Right? So the Creator is doing all these actions on me. I don't feel it. But in order for me to feel it, I have to come to an equivalence of form, which means I have to align myself to His frequency. Now, because the Creator, according to what the Kabbalists say, and we may not feel it that way, but still, we have to make an assumption, like in science. In science, we have an assumption, and then we want to prove that assumption to be correct. So, in, so what we're going to do as well, by studying in the group and trying to become similar to good that does good in the environment, we're going to go through personal change, which means change in form. Now then, oh, and that's called progress inside, inside our development. Now, three things I needed to explain to you, which was, where, is, where did I write those things? No? Okay, Lishma. Lishma. This means for the sake of the Torah, for the sake of the light, or you could say for the Creator. Okay? Lishma means for the Creator. Not for me, but for the Creator in the book. Okay? Just in case you don't know. If you want to read the book again, you'll come, come up to these terms so you won't know what it is if I don't explain it. And then there is Lolishma. 
Lolishma means not for the creator. Not for the creator. Okay? In other words, it's for me, which is fine also. And the other thing we need to talk about is going above reason. This is a very important situation because this is how we study Kabbalah, going above reason. There are three states in life. I can go below reason. I can be in my reason. I can go above reason. If I go below my reason, that's usually the religious. What does that mean? It means I tell you something and you believe what I said to be true without attaining anything. And that's called blind faith. Religious blind faith. Also, this is not called believing in God as they may have you believe on the outside world. Why? Because you're believing what somebody told you and you took it as fact. That's not believing in God. That's believing in what somebody told you. Okay? So a lot of people think they believe in God because they believe in what somebody else said. But in spirituality, in Kabbalah, that's actually called idol worship. It's like the last thing you want to be in if you're religious. Okay? Because why? It's not really God, is it? Somebody told me. And then that's why you can see a lot of religious environments going crazy. Reason is very good. Reason is a logical person. Logical. A person likes to go with this common sense and reason. Okay? And usually if you come into Kabbalah, you should have some common sense. Right? You guys have common sense? You must have. Okay? Because you want to weigh this in your mind. It needs to be logical to you. You need to make sense of it. You need to say to yourself, okay, this makes sense. Okay? And that's called common sense. Reason. R usually the secular people are like this. Uh, you know, secular people also have faith in God, but according to their logic. Okay? According to how they think is right. Okay? It also won't get you anywhere, because if it did, we'd have an answer to all the questions. So the Kabbalists are saying, well, listen, we need to go above reason. Well, what's above reason? Above reason is this. Somebody has a high level of attainment. High level of attainment. And even though I don't have that yet, I want to have it. So what do I do? I take my mind and I put it to the side for the moment. For the moment. Okay? I don't believe in what he says. But I take his recommendation and I test it in my spiritual work. I test the guy who's teaching me. I test the books. Okay? And I discover if I'm feeling and going through the things they're talking about. If that's the case, then I can say to myself, Oh my God, I put my mind to the side. This is my mind. And I took his advice. Let's make him green. Okay. The advice of Kabbalists. And I took his advice and I put my common sense aside for the moment. I tested his knowledge and I saw that after I did what he told me to do, I felt what he said I would feel. Does that make sense? But I don't believe what he's telling me blindly. So in this article, Baal HaSalam just told us, what happened to all my drawings? Okay. Here, right? Baal HaSalam said that the Creator does everything. He does everything. Everything that happens to me in life. But I don't see it that way. So can I believe him? No. You know, say, do this for me. Okay, don't do Because you can't. Okay. He's writing from a place where he wants to describe to us reality. He's saying, listen. 
our life is in such a way that we need to get to the purpose of creation. So the Creator planned it all out for us. Like we, it's like having your pension plan all planned out. Okay? So the Creator kind of all planned it out for us. We don't see it that way. But the Kabbalists are saying we can come to see it that way. That's what we're studying. We want to come to see it that way. So I don't believe them. I don't go to work tomorrow and look at all my colleagues, my boss and mates and say, oh, you're all just puppets of the Creator as if you guys know what you're doing. Okay, so I don't have such a, such a relationship with the friends now simply because I just read and believed what the Kabbalists say. Okay, because that would be very silly and I will get fired tomorrow if I do that. I still have to relate to life just like I'm feeling it right now, right? Okay, and this is why we only do spiritual work where? With people who understand what we're talking about, okay? <laughs> only in the group here with the other dots in the heart. This is very important, okay? So like I answered my friend here, otherwise tomorrow you start going relating to the world like he writes here and you will get into trouble. All right, trust me. But what we should take from this lesson in the last, well, we just went over a few minutes, through a few seconds, but what we should take is this, that there is a creator that governs everything. He wants to bring us to the goal, and everything he does to me, he does, I just don't see it. I now have to come to seeing it by taking the recommendation of the Kabbalists above my reason, by, by for a moment putting my own intellectual mind aside, I will use this afterwards. I will use it afterwards to evaluate all the things I'm going through. Okay, so we don't want you to be mindless. We want to take the recommendation like a, a kid takes the advice of his father, right? So he doesn't know, but his dad has gone through life and he says, listen, son, if you do that, you're going to get yourself into trouble. So his, he listens to his dad and says, okay, dad, I'm going to do exactly what you tell me, even though he doesn't know it, understand it. But afterwards, he understands that, ah, dad saved me. Okay, so I took his word, even though I didn't agree with him. Okay, so here, slowly, slowly, as we get into the texts, we're going to discover how to start to relate to life. At the back of your mind, I just want you guys to do one thing. At the back of your minds, just start thinking about this process right now. That, you know, I don't know, some, let's say it's raining tomorrow and a car goes by and I get wet from the puddle or something. And you just relate it with the crater. Oh, the crater got me wet. Okay? Just little exercises. Just so that we can start to think about how things are happening to us in life. Okay? All right? Just little exercises, I don't know, whatever happens, you spill the coffee. Oh, the, the Creator just made me spill coffee. Okay, And why he would do everything like that? He'd do everything just so to remind you that there is he who is doing things to you so you don't forget the purpose of life. There is no other reason for him to do anything except to constantly remind us that we need to get somewhere. If we start relating everything accordingly, it will balance afterwards. As we advance, we're going to talk about how to do it, you know, in, in more advanced forms. Okay. Now the next week we're going to carry on. Okay. Maybe I might I might divide these lessons into two because the because they're a bit long, but we'll see how we go. How are you guys feeling so far? One hour is good, yeah? Yeah, otherwise are we boring? We, yes, no, we're good. Okay, good. All right, good. Okay, because you know normally we do this in one and a half hours, so I got the text accordingly, but we're trying to you know make it nice and short and sweet. <coughs> Any questions there then? Oh, we've got oh, uh, <laughs> forgot questions. We've got. Um, Just give me a few of the best ones. All right. So uh, Emmanuel from Legos wrote in. What are the benefits of attaining spirituality to our day-to-day -day activities? Well, for one thing, you'll know exactly why things happened. Isn't that great? I mean, how many times a day are you thinking, why me? Why me? Okay, well then you know why you. 
Uh, Manuel's also asking, will it be reflected in our actions? Everything will be reflected. In fact, you'll begin to see that you're not doing anything, which is great because we're sick and tired of doing stuff. And at what point will people begin to see a, transform a transformed person in us? That's, um, others won't see it. Only you will see it. Uh, Steffi from Romania is asking, what are the differences between the commandments of the Christian religion and those of uh, Judaism? I wouldn't know because I'm not in either of them. <laughs> okay, to be honest with you, I'm a Muslim. I mean, I'm not in there either, so, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, just studying Kabbalah. Now, will mm. this study, these books that you speak of, eventually bring me to the discovery of the Creator? <laughs> yes, it will. Trust me. <laughs> Did you find it, or is it, is it not it, or is not it good to want this? It's good to want it. And if I said to you, yes, I discovered it, is that really going to help you? Are you going to believe me like they do in the, in the in religions? The best thing to do when you, if you want to believe in something, right, you have to see it. And the wisdom of Kabbalah is a science where you can come really to see the Creator in everything that happens in life. And that's called belief. Believing is seeing and it's not a lie. Marjana says, how can we separate our corporeality from our spiritual one? We'll learn it. Trust me, one step at a time. Let's just do that, you know, commando crawl on the floor first, and then we'll start, we'll start getting up, and we'll just, we'll get there. Don't worry, I'm going to take you guys all the way. Relax. Vargas says, how do I realize that I'm in touch with divinity? Okay, well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there, yeah. Don't, let's not run, okay, let's not run. We're not even born yet in spirituality. According to spirituality, we don't exist yet. Okay, so we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Carmen's asking, is the desire ours or the Creator's? We have to make that desire. That's a very good question. We have to build this desire, guys. This is, th this is what's, what the onus is on us. Okay, this desire, we need Shmuel. Shmuel. Okay, this desire we need to build. Okay. This is our job. This is the only thing we actually do in life. Okay, everything else is on autopilot, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, so this is the only thing we have to do. There we go. Now, Steffi from Romania says, at first glance, it seems very convenient for our ego to report only to one force, only to the Creator. How does everything He is in us, practically, we do not do anything? However, where is our free choice? Well, our free choice is only in the environment. That's a really nice question. We did free choice in the first semester, only in the environment. So we have a corporeal environment, all right? And we have a spiritual environment here. You want to develop spiritually, you've got to take part in the spiritual environment to develop your spirituality and corporeality, you want to be in there, you've got to be in a corporeal environment, okay? Now, even though, what did I say a while ago, even though the Creator is doing everything, all my thoughts, actions, the whole world is run by the Creator, and all of us are like puppets, you don't see it that way. So you can't go out to the street tomorrow and not do anything, because life will compel you to do. This is a very interesting thing, it's a nice point, but you'll see that life will convince you that you have to do it. It's just really interesting. The Kabbalists write it that way. We want to believe that, but you wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to feel like you're going to do everything today. <laughs> it's weird. Now, Melissa from Nairobi is saying, but isn't Kabbalah also believing what someone else is telling me? No, exactly not. It's attaining. Never believe. Just this is exactly what I said. This is exactly what I just told, told, told you in the article. You go out tomorrow, you don't believe that the world is run by the Creator. You go to your job, you go to your office, and it's you doing your work. It's not like the Creator is doing anything. You're doing your job. You're running around with all the meetings and, and dealing with all the work that you have to do during the day. You don't see the Creator doing anything. You will never be able to convince yourself that the Creator is doing anything. Rajana asks, we were created in the image of the Creator, fully connected to one soul, but there was nothing to learn in this stage. 
So the Creator split Adam HaRishon in separate souls clothed in corporeal bodies to experience what materialistic life is all about. Is that true? It's true. It's true. A materialistic life is egoism. So from egoism, we have to experience egoism. So on top of that, we can build love and bestow. Okay, because the only thing missing in everybody's life is what? Love. Really, seriously. Only thing missing on the planet is love. If we had that, trust me, this place would be heaven already. So that attribute we need to get to, which is the Creator's idea and understanding of love and bestowal, not according to what we think what love is. Now, Gerald Coleman is asking, if all is in line with destiny, then why did the Bible talk about the fall of Adam and Eve? Was that part of the Creator's plan? <clears throat> Everything is the Creator's plan, okay? It's like, it's like Eve, Eve and Adam. It's a story. We'll get in there. We don't have time right now, because, um, but we'll get there, guys. We'll go through all of this stuff, okay? I'll tell you about Eve, Adam, Eve, everything, even the snake. Ooh, very exciting stuff. Okay, we can talk about it. We'll even make a Hollywood movie out of it together here, all right? But, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's coming. It's up in the further lessons. Let's just stick to what we, you know, what we can digest right now, okay? That's it, right? We've got a few more. You want to... Just do it quickly so okay. that next lesson we can get smashing straight away. Uh, this one is from Michael. Michael says, so we should have more... We should be more accepting of what happens to us. In other words, we should just submit to our destiny. I wouldn't do that yet. Just have in the back of your mind that we're living inside a system that there's a system working, and I am part of that system. There is a machine, and I'm part of that machine. All right? Just think of it in that way right now, because if you start submitting, you begin to delete yourself. And we don't want Michael deleted. We want you active, participating in there. In, as we advance, we will discover exactly where we're active, where we can do something. And we'll discover that. So don't delete yourself in the meantime at all. Varga from Romania. If everything is controlled and guided through a system by the Creator, how can we explain a genocide or a crime? Are they the will of the divinity? Everything is the will of the divinity. Just like I cannot explain why my hair is falling out. It's just that time, man. It's just that time. Okay. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It's not a joke. Okay, all our body loses, we, cells die every day. Why? Because we're in one system, we're in one body. And we have to look at it pragmatically. I know it's an emotional thing for some people, but we have to look at life quite pragmatically from a side where we don't know what death is, we don't know what life is. And, and who told us that death is a bad thing? Maybe there's something much better after it. We don't know. Okay. Claire Bezel is asking, what is the focus of each of the four books of Moses? It's talking about how we can get from here to spirituality, that's all. It's only talking about spiritual worlds. It is not a history book. It is not talking, it is not written to talk to us about the history of somebody. Now Claire is also asking, why do some people choose not to get closer to the Creator? Are you saying that the Creator chooses who will persist and get close to them? So that brings up the question of chosen people, doesn't it? If you have a dot in the heart, it's a... Okay, this is also, this is also a, a question. We're all in a system, right? Inside a system, I have a little brain. In my body, there's a little brain. Okay, in the brain, there's a thing size of a pea. And that is the thing that governs everything. So brain, let's just call it brain for short. Okay. If the brain works correctly, what happens? The whole world, the whole body functions correctly. Am I correct? If I have a healthy mind, I have a healthy body, right? Okay. Why? Because if my mind is healthy, I can, I can do things properly. Now the whole of humanity is down here. And if you have a dot in the heart, your obligation is to be up here.
It's just how it is. Will everybody attain spirituality? The whole planet will have to attain spirituality. But if you have a dot in the heart, yeah, it's called the chosen people. Enoch says, what's the difference between those who develop their soul through religion and those who do it through Kabbalah? You can't develop a soul through religion. You can develop blind faith through, through religion, but you can't develop your soul through religion. Soul means while I'm living here, I become like the Creator. I see the Creator, feel the Creator. I live with the Creator while I live in this world. That's a person with a soul. If a person doesn't achieve that while he's living in this world and he dies, it's like your cat or dog dying. Michael says, what happens in the corporeal, to, what happens in the corporeal influences whether we seek the Creator? So how can we separate them? We'll, we'll learn everything. We'll learn how to bring things together, guys. Okay? We need to understand just a few basic things here. We need to discover the Creator from the concealment that we're in. Discovering the Creator can only be done if I have a sensory organ called the soul while I'm living here. All right? And that's the whole purpose of the study. The whole reason that this world exists is so that we can attain the Creator while living in this world. I understand some people believe something will happen after death. Nothing happens after death if you don't have a soul. Oh my God, it's 10.15, according to our time anyway. Okay, we're going to love you and leave you until next week only. You have some homework, okay? Please. None else besides him is the first article. You just do me a favor, do yourselves a favor, read it a few times because this is the fundamental article where you can actually relate everything to spirituality in this one article. All right. Any dramas, any problems, we'll be back with you next week. And, um, and if you have any questions or, at all, you can also send them um, through the email and we'll try to answer them as well if any, there's anything not clear. All right. Take care of yourselves. You're all looking great on Zoom. Um, I hope those who don't participate in Zoom will also participate soon as well. Take care of yourselves. Have a great evening.